All right, guys. I'm Jesse Green of Shapes of Nature. Peter Clausen from Bugs in Cyberspace. And we're on Animal Talk today live with Dragonflies with Frank Barris. Frank, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Chat about what you do and why you love dragonflies sure. so much. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I don't. That's a that's an easy topic to talk about. I uh, usually don't people people uh, don't ask me to talk about it. Uh, I just start, and they usually just uh, have to listen. I work as an aquatic ecologist, and um, uh, a a big thing that I have studied um, in my past, in my career, and in my education was using uh, aquatic insects as indicators of water quality. So some of you may be familiar with, um, with this concept, but basically cleaner streams can hold certain insects while polluted streams will hold certain other insects. Uh, so when you look at the ratios of how they occur to each other, you can, be, you can get a lot about uh, the health of a stream. Um, so in doing so, I, um, uh, I, I took a, a, great, uh, a great appreciation of, of trying to catalog these things and identify them. Um, and one thing I noticed is that dragonflies are super easy to photograph and they're relatively easy to identify and uh, they're flashy, they're big and they're cool um, and they're everywhere. So, uh, you know, after diving into it a little bit, I realized that, uh, you know, th this is uh, kind of my favorite insect. Um, and once you get going, uh, it's really hard to stop. Uh, so, so I started to find... Um, uh, some rare species that live in our area. So now you become uh, playing real life Pokemon, uh, which is what entomology essentially is. It's why I never really played the game. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because uh, you go out and you try to find the coolest ones. And um, uh, so, yeah, it just basically went from there. So I I've only been photographing them for maybe about a year. Oh, right and, on. Uh, okay. Yeah, and I started, um, I really like. Uh, uh, using the app I Naturalist to catalog what I find. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a couple dragonfly-specific ones, like Odonata Central, uh, stuff like that. But using iNaturalist really got me into trying to get better and better pictures because some of the differences are so subtle in the identification that you can't always tell what it is from a picture. Uh, so, you know, going from there, it kind of turned into something that I, <laughs> you know, can't stop doing. Amazing. You know, uh, I was going to mention uh, with about Pokemon is when I was a kid and people were introducing me to that video game, they were like, yeah, you, you play this game where you like, you, you catch all these different animals and then you, you can like raise them and all stuff. And I was like, I already do this in real life. Like, why do I need to play a game? <laughs> you know, like, like, I was like, yeah. I, and I'm called a nerd, you know? Like, you know? Be yeah. honest, tell them what your Pokemon Go level is, Jesse. Oh, yeah, oh, I'm at level 40 in Pokemon Go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, I get to go walk around the world and find them. That's, uh, that's yeah. amazing, you though. Yeah, you can play um, Pokemon Go with dragonfly hunting. You know, I really so. wish they would make a game that would be, like, bug hunter that's Pokemon, but you find just real bugs. And <laughs> yeah. It would be amazing, but uh, I don't know how popular it would be. <laughs> Don't spread that around until you copyright it. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, um, I guess, you know, since we're kind of getting into dragonflies, uh, some people may not really know exactly what a dragonfly is. So why don't you give us your best description of what a dragonfly is? Sure. Um, so dragonflies uh, arise from a very ancient, ancient lineage. Uh, uh, 325 million years ago or so. Uh, were, were the precursors to the dragonflies. So those those were the protonata. And um, something like 250, uh, 250 million years ago, the, the actual odonates started showing up. And the difference was they had this pterostigma in their wing. So that's the little dot that you see at the end of the wing of a lot of different dragonflies, well, all different dragonflies. Uh, and sometimes it's used as an identification cue. And um, so, I mean, I have some here. I, I, I really wanted to go out in the field and catch dragonflies and show them to you today, as I told you, Jesse, but... It's a dream. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, we're in the fall. Uh, th there's not that many left. So yeah, I, mean, I gave it my best. I tried. Uh, I, actually, I actually went out today and I had one right in front of me, but I would have had to held it for... I, I would have had to uh, keep it in the cage for like three or four hours. And I was oh, like... Ah, yeah. I can't do that. These guys are at the end of the rope here. So yeah, I mean, uh, 
So once you started getting this pterostigma at the end of the wing, you start to have the actual odinates. And, um, you know, these are, uh, uh, the wings of an odinate are different from almost every other insect. Uh, they have this um, pro, uh, pro-opterygian uh, wing style. It's, uh, they're called the paleoptera. And it's basically the muscles inside the body attached directly to the wing. So that means that uh, the only, and that's why uh, damselflies' wings fold up and dragonflies' wings actually fold up too, but they have secondarily evolved to have them out flat. Um, and mayflies will also have their wings fold up. So these, this is like a primitive wing style. And that, but that means that every wing can move independently from each other. So if you look at um, a, a, um, a neopteran insect, which is really everything else, the muscles attached to the thorax and that moves the wings. So th this is kind of an explanation of why dragonflies are so speedy, why they can move around so much. And, uh, you know, it makes them very unique out there when you look at them. Plus, I mean, they're every different color. They're gigantic. They're small. You know, there's all kinds of things. So, um, it, you know, that's, that's pretty dragon, dragonfly history, the, the abbreviated version. Right. Well, I was going to ask uh, about their life cycle. Sure. Uh, so dragonflies... Um, you guys, you had asked me, uh, what, what, what do you call the larva? Do you call it a larva, a nymph, or a or naiad? Which I really thought is, is it's really an interesting question. Um, so dragonflies are all aquatic as larva, or mostly aquatic. Some can survive in, in really damp soils. Uh, that's really an oddball thing. They're, they're usually in streams, um, ponds, lakes, really anywhere. Some of them uh, rain pool gliders actually can be in temporary pool, like temporary puddles. They can grow and hatch out in the same year. Um, so they, they start off aquatic. That's where, as the egg hatches aquatic, and then they can live there um, for a couple months in, in tropical regions up to years. They can be three years or more up in more temperate regions um, where they're an aquatic predator of a uh, you know, everything else that's in there from mosquito larva to fish. Um, it, after, uh, it, this is when they molt and this is when they grow. So they can molt, you know, 20 times into this. And the final molt, they crawl out of the water, come up uh, up to a stem, a uh, stem of a plant. Um, each one has a little bit of a different strategy. But uh, that's when they kind of hatch out and they come out of their uh, larval case as the winged adult. Uh, they spend a little time as as a tenoral, which is if you've ever seen a picture of a dragon flying, its wings are like super shiny. Uh, they're not really transparent; they're more translucent. That's one that just hatched out, and uh, it, it takes um, sometimes up to a couple hours for the wings to harden, and they pump their hemolymph through the veins of the wings until they're actually able to fly and they're hardened. Then you have an adult dragonfly, and I mean a lot of them only live for uh, a couple weeks. I think the longest recorded time is maybe two months for an adult to live. Um, wow. So, yeah, they were really interesting. Is that a specific species? Is that a specific species? What's that? The longest living of two months, is that like, or is that a specific species or a specific family <laughs> of dragonflies that do that? Or uh, I just came across that. I'm not quite sure which one. A, a lot of the ones that, when I go to try and find the, the more rare dragonflies, it's usually these ones that have a very narrow window. Um, and some, um, there's one I was just reading about today, and I can't remember the name of it for life of me, but it'll only, you'll only find the adult being active for, for maybe 30 or 45 minutes after sun, sunrise, and then maybe an hour before sunset when it's like the darkest amount of time. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff like that. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a ton of them. There's, uh, you know, something like uh, uh, 6,000 species worldwide. Uh, in my area, we have um, 462 is the latest count. So, they have a uh, lot that's to North get America. done. I'm sorry, that's North America. What's that? They have a lot to get done in that short adult lifespan. What are their predators in nature, both as aquatic <laughs> and then as adults? Um, the, the larvae really are uh, kind of a, a top predator themselves. Um, you know, they're eating small fish, like they are uh, tadpoles, things like that. Um, but, but fish themselves will come and eat. I mean, 
obviously a, a full grown fish is going to see this. Uh, I think it's a good meal there. That's why um, uh, sometimes this is uh, when people go out fly fishing and they're using nymphs and they're floating nymphs. If you use a larger one, like let's say a woolly bugger or something, you know, you, you could be mimicking a dragonfly. Uh, it's, it's called a naiad because it's aquatic. But you could be mimicking that right there. And, um, y y you know, that's, uh, it's a big source of food, not only for the fish, but, uh, you know, when I think even in some places in the world, uh, humans will gather large dragonfly larvae and eat them. Really? So, wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. I'd try that. <laughs> I'd try. Yeah. Peter, you try eating I think they have, <laughs> they have, some, they have some gut parasite. So, <laughs> you probably want to cook them first. Yeah. yeah. They'll, just, they'll just eat one of the other parasites. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. usually when I'm out catching, I just grab one in midair and just, you know, wolf it right down. It's awesome. No yeah. <laughs> so, are, are they uh, uh, cannibalistic, uh, both as larvae or naiads and adults? Um, I, you know, I think I, I never have come across an instance or, um, read about a uh, species eating itself mm -hmm. uh that maybe th that could happen uh they certainly eat each other all the time uh d different species um there's actually one of my favorite dragonflies is it called the dragon hunter and it's called the dragon hunter because it <laughs> makes a living eating other full-grown dragonflies oh wow um okay i want that as my yeah, starter so, pokemon right there <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah they uh, you know, and actually I found one, I had found one this year, and I don't think an adult had been uh, photographed in my county uh, yet. I think the larvae have been found, and or the, the nymphs, and um, they're gigantic. They're, uh, uh, you know, th this is a dragonfly that eats other dragonflies. It's, it's going to be big, and it's going to be powerful. Um, and, and there's been records of them taking hummingbirds. Wow. Yeah, and a hummingbird is like two grams. I mean, they're 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 relatively heavy compared to a dragonfly. Uh, I don't think that's a common occurrence, but you know, if, if the hummingbird has just migrated and is uh, weak and maybe fluttering around and looking like something else, I could totally see one of these things hitting it. So. I, I just have the comment. Jason goes, "I'd eat the hell out of a dragonfly if Jesse caught it for me." <laughs> all right, all right, Jason, I got you covered. <laughs> <laughs> I'll catch a dragon hunter. You'll get a nice meaty one. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, right. So, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about, um, like, kind of the anatomy of dragonflies. Obviously, how are they such good hunters? They have these big eyes. And what are these mm -hmm. eyes, I mean, what are these eyes good for? I mean, what, what is so special about their eyesight? Um, the eyes are uh, incredible. If you, if you ever want to go and just read about one topic... Go look at dragonfly eyes. They have, um, there's these opsin proteins, right? And these are um, light, some wavelength, light wavelength receptors or something like that. But anyway, they have 30,000 individual eyes mixed up into these big compound eyes. And along that, they form these um, foveal bands that, that basically are focus areas. So when you look at the dragonfly's eyes in an image and you see the different spots, those are all kinds of different spots of focus. Um, and the adult dragonflies, uh, their eyes kind of go up around their head, right? And damselflies are more on the side. But an adult dragonfly can literally see it around its entire head. So if you ever try to sneak up on one, it's very hard. And I've tried to sneak up on a lot of them. And uh, usually they fly away pretty quick. Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> You and I mean, they're both like, like we said earlier, with the wing muscles and the way that they can perform such acrobatics with every wing moving independently. Um, you know, they, they uh, they're uh, like aerial acrobats, essentially. Uh, here's um, something about their eyes I've always recognized. You know how they always flick their heads up and side to side. They kind of do that little like head yeah. flick all the time. So is that yep. for hunting? Is that so they can kind of gauge? uh their area that they're around you know they're always kind of set on a high point looking around for other bugs is that what that's for you know i i'm not sure if that's it it could be it 
Um, but if you if you ever uh, next time you look at an image of a dragonfly, and I'm sure I have one or forty sitting around here somewhere, but there's kind of a line in, in the middle of their eyes, and it looks like one area will be one color and one area will be another. That's because they have different receptors, and they are they're receptive to different wavelengths of light, whether it's UV or short wavelength or whatnot. So the, the sky to a dragonfly appears very, very bright. And that is very helpful when a tiny mosquito comes flying by. They can, they can pick that out very easily. So I don't think they would even need to necessarily look around because kind of their eyes are already doing it for them without even moving. Right, right. Um, you know, another thing about dragonflies that I've always noticed is, you know, most predators or prey uh, especially in the insect world, they rely so much on camouflage, but yeah. dragonflies don't. You know, they're flashy, males especially. Male, some, you know, right. dragonflies have those iridescent wings that are red or green or all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And and yeah. Uh, obviously that's a lot of it's for territorial reasons and whatnot, but why don't? I mean, it's just they just overpower the prey that easily, or, or I mean, are they just not worried about predators? Like, why do they not rely on any kind of camouflage or anything like yeah. that? I mean, it's a, it's a good, it's an interesting question because um, actually, Peter, you had asked before about adults being prey as as um, as adults, and um, there's been instances where things like green darners that are migrating are are closely followed by like a nighthawk migration because they are hunting the darners. Um, you have to keep in mind how fast and how agile they are in the air, so they're not super easy to catch. And combine that with the eyesight, and then uh, you know it, I I've tried to catch them with nets before, and occasionally I'm successful, and sometimes most of the time they see me and get out of the way. Um, but the uh, it, when a dragonfly is most vulnerable is when it's perched. So uh, early in the morning, um, I'll go out and I'll go looking for darners, and uh, a, a lot of times their colors aren't quite as vibrant; they haven't heated up yet. Uh, they do tend to blend in a little more when they're at the most vulnerable. So it, it's kind of an interesting uh, thing there. I noticed that uh, the males and the females are often differently colored. Uh, let's talk yep. a little bit about uh, reproduction and um, tandems. We, we often see two dragonflies connected together, flying right. together with, I think, the male holding the female, some part of her body often behind her head. Right, all kinds of stuff. I, luckily for you, I really, uh, dragonfly sex is one of my favorite topics. Oh, right. Um, so, and it's actually, I this it's uh, G-rated. I promise this is, yeah. If you, if you, you couldn't you tell, it's great. Right. Tapes of Nature Live After Dark, all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. If you couldn't tell, dragonfly sex is super complicated. Um, <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, there is, there is a, think of one problem with dragonfly sex is that when you go down to a pond, you don't just see one type flying around. You see all kinds of different dragonflies flying around. So, um, you know, the, the male really approaches the female in almost every case. Uh, and let, let's start with, with the basics. Usually the male will be flying around potential egg laying sites the females are going to be off, off in a field somewhere because they want to feed and they want to, you know, um, do whatnot. And then when one decides it's ready, it comes down to the end, to the edge of a pond, let's say, uh, and is immediately harassed by males. If you go watch any group of dragonflies anywhere, you, you're going to see this. And uh, it's, um, it, you know, one male will try to go up and it takes these claspers at the end of its abdomen and it inserts them into grooves on the back of the neck um, of the female. So that's what you call in, and then it's in tandem. Okay. So it's, it's not, uh, it, before it even does that, it needs to transfer a sperm packet from the ninth segment of its abdomen. So the bottom of its abdomen needs to be transferred up to its handules, which is under the second segment of its abdomen. So his little abdomen curls around like this and transfers it up to its little dragonfly penis there, which is the actual term for it. Uh, the the no, hamules. Fly penis is the actual term. It is actually yes. So it, it also has little little dragonfly hamules, 
so these are these uh, hooks, basically, under its sec second uh, segment there. And um, so once he does that, he can get the female by the back of the neck with the flash. And then um, the female needs to either be coaxed or willingly move her the end of her abdomen up to where the dragonfly's uh, male's second um, segment is there. So then you kind of create this uh, what a heart. This is, this is unique to the odonates. So this is called a wheel formation. And um, it like a heart. Look, it looks like a heart, guys. I see it love. Does, I see love. Look at that. I mean, I couldn't even draw that. You know, that is just too special. <laughs> There's love, but I mean, so so the male's hamules, which are those hooks, are actually like a set of tools, a set of tools to scoop out other males' deposits that came before him. So, oh, well, yeah. good on you. And then uh, a lot of times they'll stay linked up. <laughs> Uh, they'll stay linked up so that the fe so he can guard the female while it's laying eggs in order to keep other males away. Um, you know, like any like any good uh, dragonfly, you know, mate should. Um, Do they continue to feed when they are uh, linked up together like that, or you know, sometimes they're in that heart shape, but sometimes yeah. they are you know in, in a linear fashion where you know right. they're just in a line. They can, do they continue right. to during that time? So when they're in tandem like that, uh, it, it's it's most likely that they're looking for a suitable site to lay the eggs, or um, or it's still a guarding thing, or maybe they're stuck together. My my good friend and colleague uh, Frank Parisio is a wetland scientist, and every once in a while we'll go out and look in his vernal pools, um, and the we go in there and one of the main uh, you know, apex things we find other than the uh, amphibians are the dragonfly larva. And if you think about a vernal pool, it's basically a standing standing body of water. So it's loaded up with mosquitoes usually. Uh, so that is a huge food source for anything in standing water like that. Um, the, uh, you know, they'll really take anything. A lot of times it's fly larva because it's probably the easiest. But mayflies, fish, anything, and, and these are the, um, the 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 nymphs. Um, when they become adults, I mean, you have ones that are specialized to take all kinds of different stuff. A lot of times, they're just flying around and eating these what uh, would colloquially be called like a gnat, um, and they and they have these uh, long um, long arms with with uh, big CD on them, and it kind of serves as a basket to scoop up things as they go, and it gets passed up their arms into their mouth. And they usually don't even stop flying, and the, the only thing they leave is the wings that kind of fall They off. eat a lot of uh, mosquitoes, don't they? I mean, they eat a lot. I, I think I read yeah. that they can eat up to 100 mosquitoes Around a that, day. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's probably a conservative estimate, too. There, there was one, uh, you know, some early... Um, some uh, Native American accounts would be uh, in southern uh, North America that when the dragonfly swarms arrived, uh, the fever was was on its way out because it was a mosquito-borne illness. Um, so once dragonflies were there to wipe it out, they, they would stop, you know, catching diseases from mosquitoes. Wow, that's amazing. Um, in the larvae, the, the, uh, the way the larvae hunt is fascinating is is there a name yeah. for that structure and can you describe it for the listeners absolutely um this is one of my favorite things about this really got me into dragonflies as a as i was doing my aquatic ecology work uh what you have to do a lot of times is identify dragonflies and um so here i can show you one actually I've never, I've never looked at this structure close up, but I've, I've seen it kind of in slow motion, and I still don't know what I'm looking right. at. Look at so, this. can you guys see this all right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are those skimmer larvae or naiads? Uh, these are, uh, they are skimmer. So, Labellia B is the skimmer family, and it's one of the biggest ones that, uh, that occur in North America. These are um, uh, Silithinus larvae. Um, I'll just call them larvae because uh, uh, these are uh, Salethomus larvae, so they're probably Halloween tenants. They and, look like um, toads with six legs. <laughs> and a 
crazy they, <laughs> or like corny toads. <laughs> yeah, right. They did. <laughs> so hold on, let me see if I can get a little more light on this. So why naiad? Why are they called a naiad? What? Where did that term come from? Well, from from my understanding, a naiad will have an aquatic uh, aquatic stage. So something like a mayfly or a uh, dragonfly would be called a naiad. I, I, I think it's a, a Greek term, and it referred to nymphs or young right. maidens Basic, you know, in mythology. Actually, naiad was yeah. the lesser known god. He was uh, Zeus's like second cousin removed kind of thing. <laughs> he didn't really make it on the roster very well. You know? <laughs> right. He was too busy doing wheel formations. He was too busy connecting with his girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, so a naiad would be like an aquatic larva and a terrestrial adult. Okay. Um, if you if you want to say nymph, that would be something where the juveniles and the adults are very similar. So maybe um, think of like a stink bug or a hemipteran. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Getting that mouth part, all right. Yeah, these are these are a little old. So you, you can see already that this here forms. Uh, let me move it down. This here, uh, this is called the the labrum, right? So this, uh, I'm sorry, the labrum and the mandible are on top and maxilla. So those are the chewing parts. This bottom part is called the labium, and you call this the labial mask. Look at that thing. And you can see you can see that it's uh, it's kind of scoop shaped here. So you have the um, the postmentum and the prementum, which is this arm. Uh, the dragonfly uses the the nymph will use uh, kind of hemostatic pressure, and 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 muscles in its abdomen will force blood up to the front, and that causes this to shoot out and grab its prey. That's and when it grabs it, uh, there's two um, kind of little hooks uh, appendages on here, and they uh, also shoot open and they open up like this, and then. They come back when when the thing recoils, it closes in on them, and it brings the prey up to the chewing mouth part, which which is up here. I always think um, of the movie Alien. And absolutely. How, how that, I mean, do you think absolutely. of that? Absolutely, one hundred percent. Of course. What do you think? It's probably what the disc yeah. yeah. You would uh, you'd give Sigourney Weaver flashback showing her that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, okay, so we're kind of pressed on a little bit of time here. I do want to get into yeah, sure. the Q&A, and we're going to do a trivia again, guys. So we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. So hang out. But one last question I wanted to kind of bring up is you have really been heavily taking photos of them. You said in this past year. Uh, are you? What are you wanting to do with these photos? What are your future plans? Are you wanting to take that kind of to a more professional level or kind of keep that as a hobby? Um, you know, it, it has so much overlap with what I do professionally that, there's no way that I'll ever probably stop, but I have such an abundance of photos from this year that uh, I could probably stop for this year. Um, you know, we, uh, we we try to do uh, a couple of different projects. I have I mentioned earlier my uh, one of my colleagues who's also named Frank. Uh, he's probably on here. We uh, we are thinking of starting a podcast uh, ourselves. Uh, we're going nice. to call it Frank's in the Field because we're out all the time doing these uh, ecology work. Um, so that's been in the works for a little while, uh, you know, and, and it helps to have detailed photos and stuff to illustrate all the points that we try to make. Um, even though I take a lot of pictures of him in a kayak, I, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll work it in there somehow. <laughs> Frank's in the kayak. That could be the next. Yeah, Frank's in the kayak. <laughs> Frank's in everything. Frank's in the bar. We do Frank's all kinds the of bar. Stuff. You know, I mean, you can go on forever about it. <laughs> That's during the winter. Well, well, guys, let's let's uh, let's switch here. Uh, let's switch gears here. Um, like, can Frank talk about how he gets such amazing photos? Well, we're gonna start the Q and A right now. We'll make that the first question. So, Frank, how do you get such amazing photos? Um, if you take a thousand of them, maybe one of them will turn out good. Awesome. That's fair. Come on, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, you have to uh, uh, recognize the settings on your camera, what kind of light is coming in. Um, you, you know, the photo quality was never my, my greatest um, 
greatest concern. I really just wanted to document the species and make sure I get something that's good enough for ID. Uh, and then I would get back and be like, all right, some of these are pretty good. So I'll, I'll share them around and raise awareness and stuff like that. So. And of course you just get better at the more you do it, just like any kind of art form. And exactly. And the more you spend on it. And the more you spend on it. Uh, Arthropod ambassador asked a pretty good question here. Uh, so are all dragonflies non-toxic as both naiad and adult? And are there cultures that eat them? Um, there are some that eat them. I can't give you any specifics on that. It's just something I've kind of heard of. Uh, I would say they're non-toxic, but they do have their, their, they have their share of parasites. So any kind of intestinal gut parasite, which is really the problem with eating anything straight out of a, <laughs> a stream or something like that. Right. Um, but why would you want to eat them anyway? There are there are friends. If you eat them, I can't take pictures of them. That is true. Do that to the birds, I guess. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Any photography tips for dragonflies? What are some tips? For yeah, I mean, uh, get as get as close as you can. Uh, if you get too close, you are going to scare it off without a doubt. So if you're, I, I actually use a telephoto lens for most of mine. So that's a, I use a 300 millimeter lens. So uh, here, I'll show you. If you, you can get, you can be pretty far away and still catch it with this thing. Cause I mean, it's, you have some real extension. So I can go, um, if it's the heat of the day and they're active, they are going to be gone uh, in, in no time if you come up on them. So, uh, you know, I think that, other than that, the best advice possibly is to just be patient because you, if you're walking along and you wait long enough, you're going to see something in front of you. So, I mean, sometimes you're out there for three hours and sometimes you're out there for 30 minutes and you get a hundred good pictures. So, you know, patience, keep doing it. Take pictures of everything. I noticed that they return to the same perch very frequently. Even if you do scare them, they fly off right. for just a second and then they come right back in the hand on the same spot. What is that? Right. That, that, that kind of behavior can be species specific because it may have, it may have staked out that stock as an appropriate spawning area or um, a, a, it's essentially defending its territory. So even They're if something like outside force comes in and scares it off, it's still going to go back to, to get all the, rid of all the other male dragonflies. It's usually males that do that. So it also depends on species because a lot, uh, some will perch a lot more than others. So if you've ever seen those big swarms of dragonflies, it's usually a lot of darners and uh, gliders and saddlebags. And I feel, like, I feel like some men do this at bars. They like have their favorite perch, their bar stool. It's right? true. They like right. you know, scare them off, they'll come back eventually. You know? That's right, yeah. <laughs> right. All my friends are like that. <laughs> right. All right, Ryan Tidrick asks, so when someone says dragonflies have a 95% success rate when hunting, which species are they talking about? Or can this generally be said about all dragonflies? I, I'd say you'd probably say it about all of them because because there's such an ancient lineage that a lot of their traits are shared now. Um, so th things like the big eyesight, the pterostigma, and the wings that move independently you know, kind of uh, give them an advantage as a whole, as a group. Um, so, you know, if a dragonfly is going for a mosquito, it's very likely that it's going to get that mosquito. It's just built to do that. So, um, yeah. So all of them. So uh, Steph so went green. Uh, good, good job, by the way, Steph, by going green. Uh, she asked how fast, uh, how fast they move uh, due to pressure and can you expand? Uh, due to pressure, do, do you mean the um, when they're in the water? You know, I'm not sure. Maybe, you know, in the, in the water, I mean, I'm sure we've all, uh, we've seen that video where they shoot the water out of their butts and they fly forward, which is really, uh, really great video. Uh, that's all like muscle things. So, so uh Dragonfly uh, larvae in the water uh, are really kind of burrowers and sit and wait and ambush kind of stealth predators. Um, in the air, I mean, I, I I don't think I've ever looked up quite how fast they can fly, but uh, it's very fast when you're trying to take a picture of it flying. <laughs> I can tell you that they, much. They can go from zero to 60 very quickly, unlike a lot of insects that kind of need to 
warm up to right, get up. Kind of warm, yeah, like a Beatles, uh, think of a Beatles, Electra opens up and then its wings go and then it kind of, yep. you know, a dragonfly will just be perched and then it will just be off at top speed in no time. Uh, Spaghetti Bro asks, how long do dragonfly eggs incubate generally? How do dragonflies fare over winter? Spaghetti Bro, that is such a great question. It's almost like you know someone who likes <laughs> dragonflies a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Spaghetti bro, wow. I'm really impressed with you. Uh, that's my son, actually. Uh, yeah. He's uh, He works in fisheries at uh, uh, SUNY Cobleskill, which is a, a fisheries school up here. So he's got a vested interest. Actually, you should talk to him about caddis lives. He's doing a lot of caddis fly projects. Uh, we'll have to get the, the one and only Spaghetti bro on sometime. Uh, the, the one and only. He, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, uh, the eggs, uh, you know, the eggs... In the tropics, they can hatch in five days. Uh, up here, temperate, colder regions, they could overwinter. So, you know, it depends on the species, it depends on your geography. Um, some dragonflies overwinter as eggs, some overwinter in the water. Uh, it really just depends on where, what kind and where they are. Tudo Dre asks, how far are dragonflies willing to stray from water or food? Uh, I notice them pretty far away, and usually it's the females, like I said before, because if they're down by the water, they're being mobbed by males. Uh, there's some dragonflies that are migratory, and uh, they lay their eggs in succession down uh, at certain times of the year in order to get down to warmer weather. Um, you know, they, they're so mobile that they could you could find them anywhere. Fields are really a great spot to go look for dragonflies. And, I have a field uh, down the road here at my house, and I go there, you know, almost every morning before work and uh, sometimes on my lunch break. I just ride over there on my bike, and there's always at least a couple darners flying around. And uh, I really don't know of any suitable water source, you know, within a mile. Uh, so, but a mile is nothing for a dry. I mean, they just, they just do it. They're flying anyway. They <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, H Spider 2002 asks, do ducks eat dragonflies? Um, I, you know, I really hope not. <laughs> um, I don't, the next time I, uh, I'm out there duck watching, I'll make sure to, to keep an eye on it. Maybe they do by accident when they're eating duckweed. Well, okay. <laughs> Arthropod Ambassadors asked, largest extinct dragonfly? I think its wingspan was like 30 inches. The Meganera? You know, I, I ended up reading about that for like an hour last night because it was so interesting. I didn't, oh, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I, I had dreams, especially as a child, I had dreams of like riding on a dragonfly that big, you know? <laughs> like, they one they are the largest insect of all time. Yeah. Could you imagine finding yeah. that fossil? It would be amazing. Right huh? now, I mean, the, the largest one right now is actually a damselfly and its wingspan is eight inches. Wow. And think I mean that doesn't sound big compared to the prehistoric thing, but I mean think about a damselfly, which is and you don't huge. think of damselfly being a larger than a dragonfly. Exactly. Well, Grant, Grant Higbone asks, "What is the most vivid slash colorful dragonfly you know of? What is your absolute favorite dragonfly?" Oh, um, well, in my area, uh, I'd say the pennants are really. Uh, probably the most vivid ones, uh, especially the photograph. They um, they have uh, ornate pattern patterning on their wings. They have yellow veins that run through their wings. Um, it, it really, if you get them in the right light, it looks like they're glowing. Uh, and I took so many pictures of them that I stopped putting those pictures up because some people were complaining that I kept putting the same picture up. I go, no, it's not the same picture, but it's equally fantastic. It's just amazing. Um, I mean, come on. Yeah, and, and there's also, um, uh, there's, uh, you know, there's red ones, there's yellow ones. Uh, the, the pendants really are great. Uh, Twelve Spotted Skimmers are one of my favorites. It has this alternating white and black spots on the wings. Yeah, those are those are in my favorite mm -hmm. as well, the Twelve Spots. Yeah, those are so great. Uh, Widow Skimmers look like that, too, with a big black patch and then a big white patch. And, uh, but last... as far as the blood, uh, one more, as far as the body goes, if you find a spike tail, uh, they are fantastic. Oh, They're yeah, always this tails. brown and yellow color. Uh, some of them have arrowheads. Some of them have tiger stripes. Some of them I, are. I, I actually see those out here, which is pretty cool. 
Uh, spike tails. Yeah, they're kind of hard to find. Um, last question. We're going to do this pretty quick because we got to get into our trivia here, but it is a great question. Puto Dre asked another question of, uh, it says, could Frank explain how the dragonfly has evolved over its time being here? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very primitive. It's, uh, I, I'm guessing that it's, it's forms, you know, early on are not all that much different from what we have now. And there's one family, so there's seven families in North America and there's one family, the Petaluridae, which only has, uh, I believe one species in North America. There are other species of it, but um, and if you can find one of those, a petalurity, you feel like you're looking at a primitive uh, dragonfly. Just the way that it looks, it's like stocky, um, you know, uh, it, it tends to land a lot. Uh, you they're know, kind of meaty, um, aren't they? They're pretty meaty, aren't they? They're kind of meaty, yeah. And, yeah, and we don't, yeah. I, I've actually never seen one myself. I, I look, but you'd have to go to the right areas, maybe find somewhere where it's already established and then go try to check for yourself. What is the rarest dragonfly you have ever photographed? I'll give that one, and then that's the last question. And that was by each. The rarest seven. dragonfly I've ever photographed. Um, I've done a few that are really uncommonly encountered. Uh, the rarest one was probably a uh, southern pygmy club tail. Uh, adults are not come across very often at all. Uh, the larvae are pretty common, but uh, the, the adults are very secretive, and they hide away in like uh, forested mountain streams or seeps and stuff like that. Right on. Um, I don't know if it's the coolest one, but it's definitely the rarest. Definitely the rarest. All right, guys. Well, we are going to get into some trivia now. we got a few minutes. Since we started a little bit later, we have a little bit of extra time. Uh, I'm going to go over all the rules here. Uh, there's three prize. Well, actually, uh, you said something about some prints, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so first place uh, on my end here. Uh, so first place gets three stickers of their choice. Second place gets two stickers of their choice. And third place gets one sticker of their choice. And we got some amazing prints. So uh, we wanted to do that print for first place. Oh, we can do uh, we can do one for each. Print for each one? Let's do it. Let's do it. Why not? Yeah. So uh, we got 10 questions, guys. Uh, I will say this ahead of time since uh, from previous ones. Uh, it may look like when you put up an answer that you answered it first. I'm going by what I see. It's sometimes different. So I'm sorry that if it looked like you were first, I'm just simply going by what I see, and that's how it's going to be. So that's just kind of how it is, the way to go. If we have a tie, we will go into sudden death. And that is where the people that are tied will have to answer a special question that Frank gets to bring up. So <laughs> I'm sure he's got some. So all right, all right. I'll start with Peter. What do you say? Why don't you start your question? Those prints look really great. Don't those look amazing? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I know. wish I wasn't asking. Questions. I what do you? We got. I mean, these are actually from last year. I I think that the ones that I'm going to do this year are going to be much better. That means so, they're going to be. But this says I think. But these, that's been these are five by seven. So these so are yeah, five by seven. <laughs> And the ones that I can do this year are going to be able to be a lot bigger. Awesome. And can I ask your question, and I'll, and I'll go and show you one. All right, all right. All right, first question for the trivia contest. What other group of insects are dragonflies most closely related to? And how many points is that, Peter? That's a two-pointer. Two points. Oh, that's amazing. Wow. Yeah, this will be this year. So, oh my gosh. The band yeah. So that's definitely what we're saying. Okay. I can't see the answer. That, there's, the they're saying damselflies. But that those those are in the same order. Yeah, those are in the same order. It's a no, different a... it's a different order. And it's a paraphyletic group. If that helps. <laughs> yeah. So damselflies are in the same order. No, nope, no grasshoppers, no crickets. That's orthopterans. Up, oh, we got mayflies. That was. They gave a hint. Uh, archaeology bites. All right. Two points. Archaeology bites. You got two points. All right. My question. This is one point. Is and you're gonna know. We just talked about it. What order? Are dragonflies in? What is their taxonomical order? It's a very easy one. One point. 
Boom. Spaghetti bro. I don't know. Is that, is that even fair? Uh, he, he does it. All right, fine. Go ahead. No, he gets it. He gets it. <laughs> he gets it. Odenata. You got it. Thank you, Spaghetti bro. We uh, talked about these earlier. How many points? Uh, one point. <laughs> Eight the inches order. in wingspan. They feed on spiders. What kind of aircraft are the largest damselflies in the world named after? Ooh, that's one point. Yep. Man. How to boost that one. The species name is Amygdala prepus c relatus. What aircraft are they often compared with? These giant damselflies. Helicopter. That's right. Boom. Arthropod ambassadors. Nice. I feel like Arthropod has won a few times. That's why it was only worth one point. No, that's true. <laughs> that is Just true. Kidding, right? <laughs> All right. My next question, which is two points, is what suborder are dragonflies in? What suborder are dragonflies in? Or not dragonflies, damselflies. Excuse me. What suborder are damselflies in? You know, you don't want to do dragonflies for that question because it's yeah. actually pretty complicated right Because there's now. many. <laughs> yeah, but damselflies. Well, there's, a couple, there, there's a couple answers. <laughs> yeah. What suborder are damselflies in? And it's a very strange... I was kind of curious what your opinion on Anisozygoptera was, if you have one. Right. Um, you know, I always learned it as Anisoptera, and I, I have a real hard time. Well, actually, I don't have a hard time adjusting, but I don't know why they would change the entire um, order or suborder name to accommodate this one thing to Epiprocta. No. Mel you Mel could just include Zygotera. that in the Anisoptera. But it wouldn't be phyl phylogenetically correct. So Arthropod Ambassadors got it with Zygoptera. All right, that's two points. Uh oh, Arthropod in the lead. All right. We talked about this earlier. The word tandem refers to what in dragonflies? And this is a two point. The word tandem refers to what in dragonflies? And we talked about it pretty heavily, actually, I'd say. Spaghetti Bro, getting it again with mating. All right, member of the love, the love. Uh, how many points is that? Two. Two points. Spaghetti bro tied. All right, uh, number three for me, which is two points, is what is the genus of the of giant dragonflies that existed during the Carbonif Carboniferous period? And we just talked about it not too long ago. What is the genus of giant, basically prehistoric dragonflies? Oh, and Bastards with Meganura. That's it. Right? Meganura. Oh, I knew that. Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> they're extinct, after all. Yeah, yeah, they're gone. Spaghetti bro. Spaghetti bro, you're thinking of uh, Thanks, of um, stops and flies. Right, right. So on, <laughs> on that same topic, for two points, to the nearest foot, what was the wingspan of Meganura? Ooh, Megatron. Megatron. Yes. <laughs> Yes, you know, those dragonflies were Decepticons, that's for sure, you know. <laughs> that is. Two feet! Man, arthropod ambassadors, scooping it again. All right. That was how many points? Two. Two points. All right. Arth that was two feet was the answer for that. 28 inches is the, the record I saw. Wow. 28 inches. So this Nine. is this is one point. We talked about this a lot. What is another term for a dragonfly nymph? What is another term for dragonfly nymph? Why do I have what is love, baby? Don't it's hurt not the me. Side. Don't. It's, it's all this dragonfly sex Why, you're talking about. Spicy beans got it. <laughs> and I, spicy beans. All right, man. Hey, speaking <laughs> of spicy beans, you know what I heard? I heard that Taco Bell came out with a type of wine. They call it jalapeno noir. Uh, I mean, I really hope that that comes with, like, an extra set of, like, Charmin Ultra or something like that, you know? <laughs> Some spicy wine from Taco Bell. <laughs> it was, it's a real thing. That is a real thing. <laughs> Next question for one point. 
And this is a really easy <laughs> one for someone who knows it. What taxonomic group class are dragonflies in? The class. Their class. They are in the phylum Arthropoda, but what class are dragonflies in? They're in the order Odonata, but what class are they in? They're definitely the elite class, the 1% range. <laughs> They're the bankers. <laughs> Insecta. Boom. In I no. think, yep, spicy beans. Insecta, how many points no. is there? Spicy beans is on fire. Spicy beans. That's is, the, that one that's one the sub order spaghetti, oh, bro. Spicy beans tying into second. I said one the first time. I said two the second time. That's what my last Two one. now. That's how it is. All right, this is my last question. It's worth three points. What? is the common name for Trinea lacerata. What is the common name for Trinea lacerata? I have no idea. Do you know, Craig? I know, yeah. It's one of my favorites. It's one of the best. Uh, yeah, absolutely. One of the best. But yes, Arthropod Ambassadors, you were right. It is the Black Saddleback. Yes. All right, you ask a question. This will be worth three points, whatever question you ask, Frank. All right, do you want it to be in a similar style as yours or something else? Whatever you want. Throw us a curveball. Whatever you want, Frank. Throw your curveball. All right. There are seven families, seven families of dragonflies in North America. I want you to name three of them. Ooh. I got this. Ooh. I didn't know the answer to the saddlebags, though, even though I have some in my freezer. Yep. yep. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, I was just down. That's one of the only ones I still see here. I see those, common green darners, and uh, wandering gliders. And I saw my first jewel wing ever just oh. a few months ago. Oh, and, really? Yeah. I was I was yeah. out in this grassy area next to a river. There were reeds all over the place, and I couldn't find, I couldn't find it again. I saw it just briefly, first one of my life. Yeah. And, you know, I'm getting my camera out yeah. and everything because I want to get the picture of it. And it flew away. I looked for it for 10 minutes because I knew it was right there somewhere. <laughs> could not find it. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Right. I think the craziest thing that I ever witnessed, one of the coolest things, uh, was when I saw my first ruby spot. One of my damsel favorites. Fly. Oh, oh, my gosh. Ruby spot damselflies are nuts. Oh, oh. I wish we had those near me. Yes. Can, you know what? You know what? You you don't even have to give me the um, Latin name. You can just give the uh, the common name because each one has a common grouping name. Yeah, just the family. Are the common names different in the UK, for example? Oh, come than on, spicy here beans. In the US? Oh, they are. They they um the uh, I don't want to say it because that's giving away one of the answers. But uh, they call them hawkers over there. Uh -huh. I will not accept hawkers. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> well, Ashton, all right, that's good. Mad animal lover got it. Oh, my D. All right. The man got hitting them. All right. Yeah. Good. Eshnid, which are called darners here and hawkers in the UK. All right. Well, that was the last question, tails. but but we have a three-way tie. So, Arthur Pond Ambassador, Aaron, I guess I'm sending you more stickers again. I feel like I better get used to that. Um, Did she you get first are, place? Our first place. Aaron okay. is first place again. So, but we have a three-way tie for second. And also making it third place. So Spaghetti Bro, Spicy Beans, and Madi, the animal lover, you guys can answer this question. Frank, ask another question. This will be I'm for so second place. You. I'm so proud of you, Spaghetti Bro. Um, <laughs> so all right, my question is <laughs> all right, closest without going over. How many pictures do I have right now to go through and edit from this year? Not counting, I've already discarded all the bad ones. How many do I have ready on my computer to edit this year? We're gonna we're gonna prices right this, right? We'll 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 let them three yeah. answer what they think, and then whoever has the closest gets it. All right, so right. beans at two fifty. So who got okay. who's the closest? Five thousand two hundred and forty. Well, spaghetti bro, you still get it. All right, <laughs> spaghetti bro, you got first place. All right, this is for second place between spicy beans and Madi the animal lover. You want to do a question? Okay. I, I got a quick and easy one. Uh, what part of the body do dragonfly wings attach to? There you go. That's an easy one. 
three body parts. Which part is it? Come on, what? Up oh, thorax. There you go. Madi got it. All right, Madi, you got second place. Hey, you already got a package coming your way anyway, so let me know which ones you want. Spicy Beans, you won a sticker in third place. Um, so and a you, print. And a print. Yeah, you all won prints, by the and way. Print. So if you could send your addresses, send your addresses to me on Instagram and send your addresses yeah. to Frank on Instagram. Yeah. Do you have Do you have who is in fourth place? There's only one, two, three. Yeah. There's, do you don't have a list, though? No, I just know. Like, I mean, uh, archaeology um, or archaeology uh, would be would be that fourth place. Okay, I think archaeology should probably get a print too because sure. uh, Getty Bro has unlimited supply of prints. All right, sounds good. Well, uh, Frank, this is exactly. fun, man. If you guys do not yeah. follow Frank, do it. He, I love his uh, page; is awesome. There are so many dragonflies and among other bugs as well, but definitely heavily dragonflies. So definitely check it out. This guy is the wealth of information when it comes to dragonflies, as we just found out. What do you say? Yes, you can hear the rebroadcast of this podcast on Podbean.com, and watch the video on YouTube on the Shapes in Nature channels. You know, it's, it's certainly appreciated. We are going to have you back on at some point. You need to talk about aquatic macro inverts, man. Well, we that. We'll definitely we're, go into that. We're going to need at least two hours for that. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll get you on. Thank, thanks so much. Great. And we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Hey, you guys have a good one.